I want to talk about the power of influence. Every one of us have a, a power to influence someone. You can influence them good or you can influence them bad. Can I get an amen? amen? I pray that you influence them the right way. Let me just say this. I think for a period of time, there were a lot of people trying to be influenced by what was going on on the television and the political scene. I, I want to say this with no malice. I want to say this with no judgment. The news networks do not and should not influence you. You need to be smart enough to form your own opinion. And you also have to have discernment enough to, to realize that they don't tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth will help you God. If they can write a story, sell a story, they'll just soon tell a lie about it, and then they'll come and try to make a little blurb that they had some misinformation or something the next day as their ratings go sky high. They'll lie to get ratings. But let me just say this also, that humanity will lie to get ratings too. They'll lie to you to get you to like them. They'll tell you what you want to hear so that you find favor with them. And, and too many people are looking for someone to tell them what they want to hear. Our churches are losing people because they, if they don't like what they hear in one church, they'll go to another church and they'll keep going to a church so they find what they want to hear. And if you're visiting here this morning, we just want to welcome you and say, we're glad you're here at Grace. You're not going to get my opinion on anything that I say or do. You're going to get God's opinion. Uh, at the end of the day, if you get angry, then you'll have to be angry with God and the Word of God because that's where we're going to stick to. And I want to talk to you today about the power of influence. It's important that you understand. And influence normally comes, with, as the Scripture teaches, it comes by more than one person. And in Proverbs eleven fourteen, it simply says this, Where there is no counsel, the people fail. Now let me let that set, set in before I give you the rest of the verse. Where there is no counsel, the people fail fail or fall that 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 just depends on whichever version you're looking at you're going to fail and you're going to fall if you don't have uh, the right counsel how many of you have ever made mistakes in life you wish you would have gotten advice on but you didn't you did your own thing and it was a disaster raise your hand amen put your hand down i could ask it again and some of you put two hands up mine would be up twice but again, where there is no counsel, the people fall or fail, but in the multitude of counselors. Not in the singular, but the plural. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Solomon writes that, and we know Solomon as the wisest man, and he writes it in a portion of Scripture following wisdom in chapter 11. And he's talking about, I've taught you these things about wisdom. Now here's something else you need to understand. You need to have wise people in your corner so that you don't make some of the mistakes in life. Let me give you some biblical examples as we're talking about. In 2 Samuel chapter number 8, I want you to see David's administration. And David, uh, the Scripture is really wonderful how it puts sometimes we get captions depending on what Bible we're using. But this was his administration. Some call, and then some versions it says David's mighty men. And they're both listed in different categories. But David, a man after God's own heart, David reigned over all Israel administering judgment and justice. Joab was over the army, the whole army. If you read about David, Joab is there in almost every pas uh, passage of Scripture or any significant event in David's life, you will find Joab there. A warrior will always be a warrior. A warrior will be protective of the king or the leader. And I'll just say this right now. I want warriors in my camp. I don't want no sissies in my camp. If you're a sissy here today, you are going to be offended by the time I'm done. If you're a chicken, you're not going to like it. Bark, bark, bark. I want people who won't run. I want people in my foxhole who I can trust. If I'm going to battle, I want somebody guarding my backside while I'm fighting on the front side. I want people on the side. So if I turn this way, I got somebody that way. I want people surrounding me, not just the angels of God, but I want warriors like Joab. Jehoshaphat was the attorney general. He wasn't like the attorney general we got now. He ruled righteously and fairly. And he told the king what the king needed to hear, whether he liked it or not. Somebody needs to tell our political leaders what they need to hear, whether they like it or not. 
Jehoshaphat was that kind of guy. Zodok was the Levitical priest. In other words, when I say Levitical priest, there was a certain order in which worship had to be done. And it was his job to make sure it was done a certain way. Worshiping God is no free fall. It is not what you can do, whatever you want to do. Worshiping God comes out of the confines of Scripture. And if you get outside of Scripture, somebody needs to say that's not right, as Zodok would, and tell people this is out of order and this would not be pleasing to God. You worship any way outside of what Scripture teaches, I promise you, you are violating the tenets of Scripture. Elimelech was David's family priest. Not only did he have a high priest, but he had a family priest. Let me just say this, men. You might not have a family priest, but you better grab the reins and the bull by the horn and declare yourself as priest of your home. The spiritual leader that follows what Scripture says and does the will of God in the life of his family. I'm looking for men who will stand up and be like Ahimelech and be the family priest like David has. And then there was Sarah, David's official secretary. Somebody always speaking into his ear the way that he needed to. All of these people were influencing David in his administration. Let me just say this. Anyone who leads alone is going to be in trouble. If you're going to be a great leader and you're going to be an effective leader, if you're going to be good in your job, you're going to be good as a husband, if you're going to be good as a dad, you have to have people around you. Because, listen to me, being a dad, being a husband is a learning process. Many men fail because they won't seek the advice of other godly men who have been married a long time. There are people in this church that have been married 50 plus years. There are people in this church that have been married almost 50 years. There's people in this church that have been married 40 years. And I promise you, those guys know a whole lot more than people who have been married 10 years. So it's important that we're able to do that. Then you find Benadiah, David's security bodyguard commander. Uh, you know, I want, I want somebody like Benadiah. Armor bearer is another word kind of for that. David's security bodyguard commander. Every leader needs someone who is looking out for his well-being. And every husband, if he's the leader of the home, let me just say this. Wives, you have a multiple process and you have multiple tasks to do, but one of your jobs is to protect the leader of your home. Somebody bad-mouthing your husband, you need to shut them up real quick. Husband, somebody bad-mouthing your wife, you need to protect her and do what you need to do. You say, man, what you talking about, Pastor? You telling us to be mean? No, I'm telling you, live your biblical role. Too many women are talking about their own husband in a negative way. Well, no wonder he's not good for nothing, because you ain't helping him be good for nothing. Man, your husband ought to be somebody you praise and somebody you look out for. I know he's supposed to love you a certain way, and if he doesn't, you should be on your knees praying to God that God would change his heart, but it does not relieve you of the responsibility of being his security and his bodyguard. It's not wrong for a woman to defend her man and for a man to defend his woman. And then, of course, David had his sons that were princes of the court. So he had, he had people who influenced him. Now, just stay with me. Moses had an inner circle. It was Moses. He was the deliverer, the leader. Aaron, the official speaker for Moses. Remember when God called Moses? He had lots of excuses. Lord, I can't, I can't, I, 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 can't, I, I can't do this. I'm not eloquent in speech. I find that to be a little bit of a lie because he was a prince of Egypt. He'd done great things in Egypt. He was educated in Egypt's way. He had full reign of Pharaoh's house. I don't believe Moses had such an impediment as he thought he did. He was just looking to make excuses. He was afraid to do what he needed to do, but yet his name, Moses, commands authority. When you hear the name Moses, when you look at the actions of what Moses did and how God anointed him and God empowered him. And by the way, Moses was 80 years old for all of you old timers. Moses was old strong. I believe and look at myself. I'm old strong. I just had a birthday. I'm 67. I'm old strong, though. I'll challenge these young guys to do whatever. I even wanted to arm wrestle a six foot four, 225 pound guy. He's been talking smack about arm wrestling, and I said, Throw it down, boy, let's go. And we threw it down. We called it a practice run. 
And he could have crushed my arm, but I led him to believe that we were just holding our own. Amen. And I said, I'll get you another day when we do it for real. You know why? I believe I'm old strong. Deep down in my heart, I don't want him to beat me. Deep down in my heart, I'm going to beat that 225-pound 15-year-old. <laughs> He's a beast. He's a beast, man. He squats, uh, deadlifts almost 600 pounds. He about ripped my shoulder off, but I wasn't going to let him know my shoulder was about to be torn off. You know why? I want to be old strong. I don't want to lose the look that my poppy's strong. I don't want to lose the look that just because I'm gray-headed and had a birthday that he would say was older as Noah, that I still have influence in his life. And let me tell you, strength brings influence. So I don't mean just physical. I'm talking about strength. Strengthen who you are. Strengthen what you believe in. Strengthen purpose. Strengthen life. Strengthen family. All of those things bring influence. Moses was the deliverer. Aaron was the official speaker for Moses. Miriam, Aaron's sister, was a prophetess. Joshua was general of the entire army that's going to take over. He was in apprenticeship to be a leader, following a leader. And Moses is going to train him in the same way that God trained Moses. And by the way, Moses' father-in-law gave great advice too. When Moses thought it was too big, his father-in-law set him down and says, No, you need to do it this way. You need to divide the people by thousands and hundreds and, and, and fifties and small groups. Do what you need to do. There was Eliezer, the high priest, Aaron's son. There was Caleb, the CIA director. Caleb goes into the promised land, comes back, gives the good report. He don't have to lie. He said, we can take the land. They're grapes so big, we have to put them on a pole. It's the land that God said He would give us. I know there's a, the big people, there's giants, and we're like grasshoppers, but God said we could have it. It's worth going to fight for. Caleb was a CIA director. He was telling the truth. He was telling something that ten others wouldn't dare tell. They said, let's run and hide, much like our government today. If our government would tell the truth, we'd all be better off. And they talk about unifying the country. If they tell the truth, the country could come to unity. But you got too many people lying and too much negative influence instead of positive influence. Then you have Jethro, was Moses' leadership mentor. Then you have Aaron's sons, anointed and consecrated priests for the people. It's important. Even Jesus had a group that influenced him that he constantly would bring into the fold. He was the leader. He had the twelve. He had his mother. His inner group was Peter, James, and John. We find Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were his friends. He also had great intimacy with the Father himself, who always, Jesus said, I'm here to do the will of my Father, who influenced him in a great way. Well, let me talk about the pastor, the pastor, what we have here. We have pastor and elders as your leadership group. We have a staff with their spouses. We look and respect their spouses also in what they say because we understand that both of them occupy leadership roles in their home. We have deacons and their wives. We have teachers and leaders of ministry that we listen to for influence in what we do. We don't run a one-man show, and we get advice from these multitudes of counselors because there's safety there. And everything we're going to do as a church, we consult with those people before we ever present it to you. We don't present it to you to get you to vote. We present it to you and say these wise counselors say this is what we need to do. We're not looking for people, uh, now, please don't be offended by this, we're looking for people who are consecrated, sold out, full of the Holy Spirit to make decisions for the church. We're not looking for people who attend occasionally, though we want you to continue to come, but we're not going to seek your advice on the spiritual things of God. You understand what I'm saying? We're looking for a leadership group where people participate in the giving program of the church. We're not going to take advice from someone who does not give to the church. You understand what I'm saying? You wouldn't want me to do that. You'd want me to get the advice from the best people available. Can I get an amen? The spiritual people of God to lead spiritual people. See, you can't get advice from the world and lead spiritual people. You can't do it. Now, I want to give you some things that will help you here. I'm going to give you five things today. And you say, Lord, it's 20 minutes until 12. I'm going to go real fast. I'm going to speak in tongues. <laughs> You're going to think it by the time I'm done. I just pray I don't end up like President Biden where you understand what I'm saying <laughs> as I speak fast. Amen? Your inner circle, write this down, is crucial to your success. 
The group of people that speak into your ear are crucial. And if you just have one person, you're kind of headed for trouble. If you do have that one person, that person that you go to must have a multitude of counselors so that he or she can give you good advice. If you're taking your advice from a one-man band, you're headed for trouble. Get your advice from an influence group. They're, because of their influence on you is crucial to your success. Proverbs thirteen twenty says, He who walks with wise men will be wise. Well, I can give you the other side of that. If you walk with stupid people, you're going to be stupid. Um, you understand the Greek word in, 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 this is no joke. When it says that, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, it uses the term in the Greek language that translates, I don't want you to be stupid. And same thing when it comes to wisdom. You're either wise or you're not. You're either acting the way that God tells you to act, who gives you all the wisdom that you ever need if you'll ask for it. He gives it to you liberally according to the book of James. But a lot of times we don't want wisdom. We'll go to people who don't have any wisdom. Because of their influence on you, it's crucial to your success. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Also, he's... The, this influencer or influencers are critical to your success because of their support of you. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up again. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And threefold cord is not quickly broken. In other words, surround yourself with people that will influence you because it is crucial to your success. Especially the part about falling. It's okay to fail. But if you're going to fail, have people around you that can pick you up and help you. Because if you don't, you're just going to stay in that category called failure. The moment you get up, you simply pass from this. I tried it, it didn't work, I'm ready for something else. You cannot be afraid of moving forward because of your failure. And if you've got good influence around you, you will not let a failure or a missing the mark sometimes hold you back because your counselors will encourage you to get up. You know the story of, uh, of, of Thomas Edison. You know the story of uh, Harlan Sanders. You know the story of everyone who's created something great. They had so many failures. Abraham Lincoln lost his first six political elections before he was elected to office. You've got to fail to learn how to succeed. And failure doesn't hold you back. And when you've got counselors, you recover very, very quickly. Second thing, write down. Your inner circle or your influencers will increase the limit, will increase or limit your influence. If you have no one around, your influence is going to be very small because the people around you are non-existent. If you want to have great influence, you have to surround yourself with people. Not one or two people, but lots of people. Everybody, you know, I get tired of this. I just want to kind of do it alone, and I, I kind of do it my own way. I'm a one-man band, and I don't want to get involved too much. Too many people know my business. Well, if your business is good, you don't care who knows your business. I'm always leery when somebody says, I don't want somebody to know my business. Why not? You got bad business? You with the wrong people? You doing the wrong thing? You doing the right thing? I want people to know. Amen? If I'm taking a group to Belize and got 25 people saved, I want everybody to know. I don't, want, I, don't, I don't want to say, oh, you know, I just do my own thing. And, you know, my worship with God is just between me and my God. Your worship influences other people. I was watching Justin. I love it when Justin wails. I love it when he gets down. And, I mean, he, he wants to hold back because he's not one of these emotional kind of guys. But I love it when he just lets it rip. I mean, he'll kind of go down and he'll come up. He can hit the highs and he knows how to do the lows. I like to watch our singers. I like to watch Natalie do it. She kind of likes, she likes to move when she sings. She likes to kind of get it going. And she'll get Mary and, 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 and Rose and that whole group will be going because Natalie, she don't even know she's doing it, but she's doing it and she's influencing us he's influencing us and i i don't i don't want to preach boring i don't want to put you to sleep i told a visitor day you go to sleep i'll throw something at you 
And I said it with such, I, I think, integrity and passion. He said, really? <laughs> Man, I want to speak into your life. I want you to be engaged. I want you to be part of what we're doing. And I want to influence you in the right way with the Word of God and with the moving of the Holy Spirit. And I want to influence you with the, the power and the emotion that God sometimes puts on me. If God wants me to cry, I'll cry. I don't try to fight it and hold it back. If the Holy Spirit moves my soul to have compassion or excitement or I see mercy in God or I feel the forgiveness of God and I just want to weep, then I'll weep. I want to influence you in the right way as the Holy Spirit is influencing me. You understand the Holy Spirit is the greatest influencer that we have outside the Word of God. Guiding us to do what we do. It's important. Your inner circle will increase or limit your influence. This is a fact. Jesus told His disciples that they would do greater works beyond or do works beyond their wildest dreams. He literally tells them, not only will you do the works that I do, but you're going to go greater by impact than what I do. Jesus was limited to the region of Galilee. Three and a half years. Those disciples that He trained that turned the world upside down went all over the world. And if they hadn't gone all over the world, I don't think we'd have no Bible today. I believe it, would, it was they were critical to the plan of God. They saw the example in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. But it was those 12 that went to the uttermost parts of the world to spread the gospel to influence other people for the cause of Christ. It's important that we understand our influence can increase or it can decrease by the number of people that we encounter. Don't be on an island. Don't be alone. I, I want to, you know, the, think about what those disciples did. I'm sure Jesus would have loved to take in that ministry far beyond, but he knew the scope of what he had to do. Without his dying and his burial and his resurrection and ascension, it would have just been another religion. But he did what he did so those 12 would be empowered. He knew he had to leave and fulfill the plan of God. Why? So the Holy Ghost would come and empower every believer to be witnesses. You know what those are? Influencers. Influencers. That's what a witness does. It influences a jewelry. It influences a group of people with truth. That's what we need to be today. And we, it can be limited or it can be, it can be full-blown beyond our wildest imagination. And let me just say this. Leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Here's my favorite leadership proverb. I've been quoting it for 25 years. He who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. <laughs> Let me say it again. He who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. A leader will have followers. That's why he's called a leader. He will have followers. Let me ask you this. Men, does your family follow you? I hope you're going down the right road if they do follow you. Or do they follow everything else that comes up? Or is there somebody more important in their life that they listen to? Listen to me. Take the role of being an influencer in your family. Grab that bull by the horn. It is your God-given right for you to lead your family and do the things that are necessary. Have some followers. Have some people that make a difference. I, I don't know about you, but if I were teaching a Bible class, I'd never be content. I wouldn't. I used to teach a Bible class. Matter of fact, where's Jim and Brenda? They're on the back. They were in mine and Phyllis's Bible class some long time. How long? 40 years ago, Jim? 40? Long time, 38 to 40 years ago. Amen. Jim had hair. I know that. That was a long, long time ago. <laughs> and we started with just a few people, and that class grew 90-something people. It grew. A I'm talking about a Bible class. You know why? Influence. I influenced a few, and they began to influence others. The next thing you know, we couldn't stop it. When they divided it, it grew again. They said no church class should be that big. They, they divided it, and it grew again. My first church, I had 25 people when I started, and we left. It was bigger than this. Influence. 
And we've seen this building packed at capacity. Uh, we've had lots of things that happened from COVID and everything else. But let me just say this. I believe we're going to see the day because of the Word of God and the influence of you and me. We're going to see this building packed out again just like it used to be. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I, I, I totally, totally believe it. It's important that you understand that. So, see, once you define leadership as the ability to get followers, you work backward from there, uh, from that point of reference to work out how to lead. You get followers, and then all of a sudden your influence becomes great. You work backwards from that. Sociologists tell us that even the most introverted, that means a shy person, the most introverted individual will influence 10,000 other people during his or her lifetime. An extroverted person, that's somebody that's type A that can't keep their mouth shut. <laughs> like me and a few of us. How many type A people we got in here? Can't keep your mouth shut. You're just talking all the time. <laughs> you will influence 40,000 people in your life. 40,000 people in your life. Let's pray that it's good. Do you see the opportunity that God gives us? Think about that. Shy people, 10,000. Extroverted people, 30 to 40,000 people. You have the ability to influence for God, and it does make a difference. You've got to look at yourself as an influencer. I, I am taken back by, I don't, I, I don't do the social media, and I don't know how to do all that stuff, uh, I guess I could learn, but I really don't want, I don't want to be part of some of that. I just, I, I just don't. I have spiritual, scriptural reasons why. And it's much easier for me to just talk to somebody and do all this other stuff, right? People want to argue with you, and you got people trying to comment on your stuff that you don't know, and they think they know more about the Bible because of what they think. And you don't know, look, it doesn't matter what you think about the Bible. It only matters what the Bible says. What you think doesn't matter. Amen. And they want to argue with somebody that's been teaching for 40 years and uh, got two doctorate degrees and they've attended Sunday school for about a month and they want to tell you how you need to look at spiritual stuff. I don't mess with that. But I'm taken back by people who are called influencers. And I see some of these people are influencers and I say, are you kidding me? Influencers? And they got like two million people that will click on their thing and be influenced. I don't know about that, 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 that boy that dresses up like a woman. He must be an influencer because he got a beer company to, 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 to do a commercial for him. And you know what happened to that beer company? They lost 25% of their gross revenue. Now, for all of you who drink Bud Light or Miller Light or Michelob Light or whatever it was, I, I'm praying for all of you. Amen. Don't be falling. I like what Kid Rock did. He took his AR out and went and shot them all up. <laughs> Boom. But I look at that dude, and he's an influencer. I look at influencers on the lawn of the White House. I don't need to say any more, do I? And I ain't taking my shirt off and flashing anybody either. Influencers on the lawn of the White House. You see how powerful influence is if you get an audience? Why not use those 10,000 to 30,000 people that's going to come into our contact during our lifetime for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we could say, like Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Because you know what will happen? If you're not ashamed of the gospel and you preach the gospel, people will get saved. If you go to Belize and you tell somebody that Jesus loves them and their heart is so broken and they, they don't have a clue, the Holy Spirit will take over and do what you could not do, but He will honor you because you talked about the Lord God Himself and you preached the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel message. It ain't you, it's what the gospel does. Influencers. It's influencers. Let me give you the third thing. Say amen if you're ready. You're only getting five, so we're doing good. Third thing, your inner circle should be challenged by your life. Listen to this real quick. David was a giant killer, and David developed giant killers. This is the part that some are not going to like. I'm going to be real honest. I'm going to be real open. I don't want sissies in my camp. 
I'm talking about we're going to war. I don't want no sissy doing business with the devil. <laughs> the devil will devour you like a roaring lion. He's looking. I don't want the weak spiritually trying to lead other people. I need strong spiritual people. Isn't it funny how the Bible says, full of the Holy Ghost? A good report amongst all the people. Bold. When Moses is going to pass the torch to, 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 to Joshua, he says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Honor the book. Meditate on it day and night. Don't be afraid of what they do. When Jeremiah the prophet is trying to rebuild the wall, coming back from Babylon, he said, Do not be afraid of their faces. Just preach the gospel. Pull an arrow out of the quiver. Load it in the bowl. Pull it back and let it fly. Don't worry about what they think. I don't want no sissies in the camp that's doing business with God. I want to raise up a generation of warriors. We are in the state of where we are because we don't have enough warriors. When all those Rangers and Navy SEALs ran for Congress, oh, Lord God Almighty, I thought, man, this is going to be a shakeup in the swamp. Because you're going to get those Navy SEALs and those Rangers and all of those Special Forces guys, that they're not used to surrendering. They're not used to tapping out. And they're not used to other people telling them lies. They operate on truth. I thought, man, the more people we elect like that, the better off we're going to be. People who won't run. People are not looking for personal gain. They believe in a cause. When David took on Goliath as a giant killer, David told the whole army of Israel, and he was hacked off. Is there not a cause? They're defiling the living God, and you guys are sitting there doing nothing about it. And I got to say today, is there not a cause that we got to raise up some warriors and go do business for God and knock down some Goliaths here today? We all got giants in our lives, but I'm telling you, we got to be warriors. You got to have a warrior mentality. Pastor Mike's a Bible teacher, and Pastor Mike's going to develop Bible teachers. I cannot pour my life into somebody who does not love the Word of God. I cannot. You cannot be in my inner circle. If you don't love the Word of God, I promise you, you will be uncomfortable. You might sneak your way in, but you will sneak your way out. You will find it does not work with me. Because I rule and I lead based on what Scripture says. And I develop Bible teachers. Pastor Mike leads without fear. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't lead timidly. A lot of people say, I don't like how you lead. I can't help it. Find you another leader. Because I ain't quitting. I ain't quitting. You stuck with me, amen? The people that are going to get in line are going to say, I want somebody who knows how to fight. I don't want no sissy with me either. Pastor Mike develops others to lead without fear. Don't be afraid when God's called you to do something, when God says, I want you to take point on that. If God called you, if God be for us, who's going to be against us? You understand what I'm saying? Every 6,700-something promises of God are for your sake, for you to stand on, to know that your God will not ever leave you nor forsake you. So pastor develops others to lead without fear. Pastor is loyal to his troops. You're going to be under my influence, I promise you. I'm going to have your back. I'm going to cover you, and there are people in this room who will testify. If somebody comes against you, I will stand up and defend you until the day is wrong. And if you're wrong, I'll deal with you privately. But I expect my troops to be loyal to their leader. Amen. You cannot lead if you've got people cutting your legs out from under you all the time or criticizing pastor expects loyalty from his troops and pastor trusts the lord and i expect and want others to trust the lord that i influence i will absolutely unequivocally tell you what my life verse is proverbs 3 5 and 6 trust in the lord with all your heart lead not your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him and i love you so much that i will absolutely give you my life verse and you can have it for keeps you can make it your life verse because this is the one thing that I've learned. God knows more than I do. And the more I trust Him, the greater my relationship is with Him. And I promise you, He has never failed me yet. And I'll give you my verse. 
It'll be a love gift to you. It can be your life verse today, but you've got to claim it. And it's not just saying, I claim it. You've got to live by it. That's what influence really is. Let me give you the fourth thing. If you're still with me now, say amen. Your fourth thing is your inner circle should be a conscious should be a conscious priority with the following traits involved. Now, I've got to go quick on this. It should include intercessors. People that are going to influence you should include intercessors. That means people who will pray for you personally. Jim Birmingham has been praying for me since that Bible class for 40 years. I started a pastor's prayer partner group, and I got the lady that already had a prayer ministry. I knew she knew how to pray. I knew that, that if anybody could teach someone else how to pray and experience the ups and downs of prayer and the ins and outs of prayer, it would be Mama BJ. Mama BJ's right over here. She selects her own people to be part of that team because a lot of people say, well, I want to be on the team and pray, but after a week or two, they don't ever show up. Or they'll show up and say, I, I'm too timid to pray. She knows the people that she wants when she interviews them, and that's what they do. You've got to have intercessors. Those, I have a group of people who constantly pray for me. I, I want that. Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 talks about Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Who are they? They're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their name was changed. And Daniel went to him and said, Look, there are going to be some changes around here, but here's some things we're not going to change. We're going to pray every day. We're going to put our face toward the east, and when the sun comes up, we're going to pray. And we're going to go to the window at the evening to the west when the sun sets, and, they're going to be, and we're going to open the windows. And they're going to tell us not to pray, but we're going to pray anyway. And the king's going to give us, wants us to defile ourselves with all this fancy delicacies and, and wine and this and that and all the, the, the stuff to make us fat. But no, we're going to live by the dietary laws that our God set forth. And we're going to put God first. I know there's going to be some, some stuff that's going to happen. And I know we're going to face uh, uh, some obstacles. And there might even be a time that we have to lay it on the line. He didn't know that a fiery furnace was coming. He didn't know that in that fiery furnace that Jesus would be walking with him. And they'd come out of that furnace with no hurt. He influenced Daniel, influenced Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and said, don't bend, and you'll see God move. It should include intercessors who are personal prayer warriors. Second thing, it should include mentors, those who are intentional examples and instructors. In Numbers 27, verses 18 through 23, I want you, Moses is laying hands on Joshua. Here's what happened. He had saw Joshua perform all the days of Moses. And Joshua performed well. Actually, he was called General Joshua. He rose through the ranks and he was loyal. And it was time to pass it on. Moses said, that's the man I want. And the Lord and the priests, they go and they lay hands. You can read about it. You can read about that in Numbers 27, how they laid hands on Joshua as a symbol of the anointing that was going to come on Joshua to lead the people. See, Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. He got to look and he got to see it. But the Lord says, mm -mm, you can't go. You didn't obey me when you should have. You did something. You say, it was such a minor thing. God is real particular about his worship. Moses took... Uh, God took Moses, they went on a little private walk, and when he died, God buried him. Nobody even knows where the bones are. I'm sure, I'm sure Moses is okay because he spent his last days with the Lord himself. But Joshua has to take over from Moses. Moses. Holy moly Joe. Moses parted the Red Sea. Moses, who had a rod that would swallow up Pharaoh's rods. Moses, who brought all the plagues. See, you got that wrong. Moses didn't do any of it. God did it. Moses was just the instrument. Because he was the meekest man on the face of the earth, the Bible says. But see, when it came time for Joshua to take over, Moses knew Joshua was a general. Joshua's kind of guy like me. He pulled out his sword, draw a line in the sand. He, and, and he says, look, I know you're on that side and I'm on this side, but you better choose this day who you're going to follow. I'm fixing to take over. We're going to look at some change. As for me and my house, I didn't see no vote taken. He didn't get with Mama. He didn't get with the kids. Say, Mama, Daddy, what are we going to do? Are we going to go to church today or are we not? All right, I'm going to give you a choice, church or the lake. Well, most people are going to go to the lake. We're going to have ribeye. We're going to cook some steaks. We're going to go to the lake. Are we going to go to church and hear Pastor Mike be long and hear about the Word of God? Joshua drew a line in the sand. I don't know about what y'all going to do, but me and my house, we're going to serve God influencers 
It should be mentors, as Moses was a mentor to Joshua. It should include listeners, those who are sympathetic and confidential. Too many people want to talk all the time. Sometimes we just need to listen. I have to talk to Jim and Joe and Miss Jeanette, the elders of the church. You know why I talk? I want them to listen. I talk to Phyllis about some of the same stuff. I want to bounce ideas off of them before it becomes a real blown thing. I want them to say, that sounds like a good idea. That's something I think we could do. I want to fill them out and say, are you out of your mind? Because I might be out of my mind. I want to run stuff by Justin. We talk about what changes and what equipment we need. We talk about it, and I need listeners because I'm bouncing ideas off of them to see how they're going to respond. If, some call it fleecing. If the fleece goes out and you get good reports, odds are God's going to bless what you're going to do. It should include listeners who are sympathetic and confidential. It should not include people that you talk to and then they run tell everybody else just what you talked about. I'll kick you off my team if you like that. Amen. It should include encouragers, those who are distributors of optimism. I love this verse, 2 Timothy 1, 16, 18. said, The Lord grant me the mercy, uh, uh, grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed, that word means encourage, refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Paul was under house arrest, and Onesiphorus kept bringing good news. He'd bring him a meal over. He'd take him something to drink over. He'd come and share with him as, as uh, Paul was, uh, did I say Moses? I hope I didn't say Moses. Paul was locked up in, in prison. Onesiphorus would come and minister and encourage him. And the whole time Paul was winning the Praetorian Guard to Christ, which later becomes the Thundering Legion. I wonder if he, could, if he could have did all that without Anessa Forrest coming and ministering to him. You need encouragers, folks. I don't care who you are. All of us need a cheerleader. All of us need a cheerleader. And he says this, Lord, grant him that he may find mercy from the day of the Lord. And you know very well how many ways he's ministered me at Ephesus. Anessa Forrest was an encourager. An encourager. Man, I need encouragers. Our staff needs encouragers. Our elders need encouragers. You need encouragers. Your friends need encouragers. There's power in encouragement. It also, should, also your, your group should have defenders, those who are partners in battles. I love in John 18, Peter pulls out his sword, going to defend Jesus. I know there's more to the story, but let me tell you, loyalty counts, and you need people who will defend you. Instead of saying, oh, wow. Don't say, oh, wow. Say, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm going to check with him on that. Mm -mm. I'm going to check with her on that. That don't sound like the guy that I know. That doesn't sound like the lady that I know. Everybody needs defenders. And, I, and let me just say this. Husbands and wives, you should be the first ones defending one another and your family. It should include givers and sponsors. As Priscilla and Aquila did, they were constantly giving to the ministry of Paul and the work in Romans 16, 3 and 4, who give unconditionally supporting and backing what the church does. It's pretty amazing. We've been at Grace now going on 22 years. We have never failed to meet our budget. You know why? We got backers. We got givers. We got people who are behind the program. Even through COVID, not one person missed a paycheck. Not one bill went unpaid. Not one creditor was called and said, we can't pay you. You know why? People did what they were supposed to do. It should encourage comforters. Bold with loving voices of truth. 2 Samuel 12, 7, Nathan shows David where he's wrong. After David sinned, Nathan goes to him and says, Hey, there was someone who stole a little lamb. The person only had one little lamb. David said, I want you to bring him to me. I'm going to punish him. Nathan said, You're that man. You're that man. When you're wrong, you're wrong. And everyone needs in their group of influencers, people will tell them what they need to hear because they love them. Not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear so that you can get right with God and get restored and get back doing what you're supposed to do. Because I promise you, a little sin, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. It's important. So it should include celebrators, those who are cheerleaders of accomplishment. Romans 12, 12, rejoice with those who rejoice. It should include thinkers. Oh, my goodness, yes. Those who provide challenge and discernment. Acts 9, 27. I like talking to Jacob because he'll challenge you sometimes. He's an educated dude. And he and I will talk. I like talking to people who will challenge me. 
because uh, I can't let anybody be smarter than me. I got to go study some more. If I think they're smarter than me, I'm going to get back in the book so I can beat them. Amen. I just, I, I just don't like to lose. If somebody knows more than I know, I'm a, it'll only be temporary because I'm going to get back in the book. So I'm going to start listening to somebody. I'm going to ask them, where'd you get that information? Where'd you get that? Because I'm going to steal it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to do it. Need to be challenged. Isn't that right? Let me tell you this. An athlete will only be a great athlete when he plays other great athletes. You ever wondered why your team loses against the teams that are not good? Because they play down to the competition. If you want to be good, you've got to play people better than you. And if you want to be a better man, you've got to run with better men. And if you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman, you can't go running around with the hussies and the whatever you do. You've got to get with the godly women. Amen. The, you can't be floozies on Facebook and saints on Sunday. You can't do it. Because the people that saw you being a floozy have a hard, try, hard time looking at you being a saint on Sunday when you, when you got... I'll just leave it alone, but... <clears throat> Can I get an amen? amen. Got to have those thinkers, somebody that'll challenge you. It should include resources, those who are sources of information and connection. 1 John 40, 22, you can read that. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew Simon, Peter's brother. He immediately goes and tells Peter, we found the Messiah. He connects one who wasn't even really looking for the Messiah. And the one that wasn't really looking, that had the great leadership qualities, failed a lot, that God is going to use to walk on water and to lead and help establish the early church. He was connected by his little brother who always lived under the shadow, Simon Peter's brother. But man, he connected Peter, didn't he? And every time you read about Andrew, you won't read about him in a book. There's not a book in here called the Book of Andrew or the Gospel of Andrew. There's not much that he ever accomplished except this. Every time you read about Andrew, he was bringing somebody to Jesus. It was Andrew that brought the little guy that had the loaves and the fish and where the multitude was fed. Always bringing somebody to Jesus. Connectors. It should include those that have the resources. It's important. Let me give you the last thing, and I'm, I'm going to move real quick. Your inner circle should want the priority of Christ in your life as well as theirs. The people who influence you should have the priority of Christ in their life, and that's what they should want for you. Jesus' word in Mark 8, it's important that you, that you see that. The Gospel of Mark, chapter number 8, it's important. It talks about the cost of discipleship. That you've got to take up your cross daily and follow Him. It's important that you understand that. And He says, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my name's sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then He goes on and talks about, But if you're ashamed of Him, you're no different than the adulterer. It has to come, that inner circle, when you listen to the words Jesus, that the priority of life is seek ye first the kingdom of God. And honor Jesus in what you do. This is a challenging passage that disciples should pass on to others. It includes the following, the challenge to forget self. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. It's not an easy challenge to accept. Discipleship calls for giving Christ first place in your life. Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Your influencer should, number one thing, to make sure Christ is the most important thing in your life. As it's the most important thing in their life. They shouldn't ask you to do something that they're not willing to do. It's important. The challenge to full surrender. A Christ follower, an influencer, is about less of oneself and more of Jesus. If I'm going to speak into your life, I want to speak into your life, and I want you to see Jesus in me. I want to reflect God's very attributes and nature in my life, and that's what I want to pass on to you. I want you to understand that, the challenge of full surrender. You cannot be all that you're supposed to be unless you fully surrender. You can't surrender to some things in your life and not the, all the things and expect God to bless you with all things. If you want to get all things from God, then you've got to surrender all things to God. You've got to say, He's Lord of my life no matter what, no longer me. 
It's important that you understand that. And others around us will help make the challenge of full surrender possible. The challenge to being committed to follow Him. Only the saved can follow Jesus. And by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, John 14, 6 and 7, I'll pray the Father, He'll give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. You understand, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be born again. You've got to be saved. You can't be half saved. If you're half saved, you're half lost. You understand what I'm saying? And some people, even in their salvation commitment, want to be half committed. I want to be saved, but I don't want Jesus to be Lord. It doesn't work that way. When you get saved, He is Lord, and that never changes. Some people think they're saved because they got it in their head and not their heart. And they've let other people tell them, you're okay because you're better than somebody else. Somebody else don't count. It's only you that counts when it comes to your salvation. What you know to do, you need to do. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing or not doing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Total commitment. It'll take courage, trust, wisdom, and you've got to trust those around you. But you can do it. Why not today? Why not today? This whole thing, this whole day is about influencing you to make a decision for Christ. Do you understand that? That's what life is all about. Influence influence the holy spirit influencing you you influencing others and if you're not influenced by the holy spirit then you're not saved if you have not the spirit of god you're none of his the bible says romans 10 9 or 9 10 you're not his if you don't have the influence of the holy spirit you say the holy spirit doesn't talk to me he talks to every saved person you couldn't be saved without him talking to you you couldn't commune with god without the holy spirit working through you God would never give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ if you didn't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reports back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit says they're born again. The price has been paid. They trusted you by faith, and God gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ, where now you can approach the throne of grace. It happens really like in an instant, but the Holy Spirit is involved. Kenny's going to be here in just a second. I've preached this whole time to influence you to follow Christ. To influence you to make a decision to follow Him better if you are saved. I've influenced you. If you've got people speaking into your ear that are not good for you, I'm going to tell you, you need to get away from them. Let them go. They don't love you the right way. They don't love you the right way. If you're thinking about, well, I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to find greener pastures where I'm going to find somebody that they'll tell me what I want to hear. You're outside the will of God if you do that. You are. Wherever God planted you, You need to bear fruit. If God brought you here, start bearing fruit, and you do that with influence. You have the power of influence. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. Your life should testify of what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. The Word of God guides you through that process by the Holy Spirit. You have other believers to look at. You have a leadership that we talked about today of what we require, who's in our corner, who's in our circle. We have no personal agenda outside of God's agenda. When nobody here gets rich, we all are paid, we all pay taxes, we all are accountable to someone else. This is not a one-man band. This is, this, and by the way, there are no democracies in the plan of God. There's only a theocracy, God in charge. You say, well, that, that, we're, it's a democracy. No, it's not. It's either God's way or the highway. Man, I, I use the term influence, and I want it to be personal. I don't know how to say it any other way except this way. The influence that God gives is the influence of love. When He influences, all we see is love. I want you to know that I love you today. And I only want good things for you. I don't want anything bad. I certainly don't want to see you go to hell. Because if if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Now, that's influence. That's strong. Hell was never made for you. God loved you so much. He never made hell for you. Because He's a just God, sin has to be punished. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit is influencing you today. I pray that I've tried to influence you. Now, here's the point of influence. 
You either follow it or you don't. Go back to the opening statement in Proverbs. Let me give it to you one more time. Talking about safety and a multitude of counselors as we look at that, right? There's safety in a multitude of counselors. That's what your inner circle should be. Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where there is no counsel, the people fall or fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Let me ask every saved person in here today. I want you to speak to a person that's not sure if they're saved. Isn't there safety and success in following the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior? Can I get, that? Can I get an amen from all the saved people? Would you all encourage anyone that's not saved to follow Christ as I would this morning? Would you give me a hearty amen saying they need to follow Christ as you influence them? Has Christ been, been a, a life change for you and a purpose in life and the hope of your life since you accepted Jesus? Isn't your life different now? Would you tell every person that's not saved that Christ has made such a life change in your life that you'll follow Him forever? Can I get an amen? There's not one person in here that's a follower of Christ that would tell you, I regret following Jesus. If you're not saved today, listen to the words of what I said. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And listen to the words of the people that are saved in this church. And if you're not saved, I want you to stand up right now where I can pray for you, where you can be saved, where you can influence other people. Those 30,000 people you're going to come in contact in your life, you can influence them for Christ, but you can only do it if you're born again. You can influence them about a bunch of other stuff, but not about Christ. You can't tell them about Christ unless you know Christ. You can't tell them how to receive Christ until you receive Christ. If you're not saved today and you want to be saved, I want you everybody bow your heads, please. This private moment now. It's going to be me and them. I want you to stand if you're not saved where I could pray for you. And do it quickly. Do it quickly. God bless you. Is there another one? I'm looking to my left. Just stand right now. If you don't know Jesus, stand. I'm not going to come get you. I'm not going to shake you. I'm going to let you sit down in just a second. Just stand real quickly where I can pray for you. Is there someone else? Someone else? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Let me pray for that one person right now. We're going to do it this way since it's only one. I'm going to ask them to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe today you died for me. I receive you as my Savior. Father, I want to acknowledge you as my Savior and Lord, and I surrender my life to you today. Amen. If you're a believer here today and you say, I want to surrender some things to God, and I want to be a positive influence, Pastor, pray for me. Slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Hands all over the building. It must be 50 hands. Put your hand down. God bless you. I'm not here to embarrass you. I pray that God would use you as the mighty vessel you can be. I pray you'd be a Pentecost person. A Pentecost person. You say, what? Speak in tongues? No, I'm not praying for that. I'm praying you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit and you'd be a witness for Him. This is what I'm praying for. For you, every hand that went up, that you'd use your influence in a positive way. Father, I pray and ask you to bless every hand that went up this morning. Positive influence. Lord, I pray for my staff that you'll use them for positive influence. I pray for my elders. I pray for my deacons and their wives and their families. That you'll use us all as warriors influencing for you. Let us be Davids and Moses and disciples. Let us be warriors, modern day warriors that are not going to take anything less. Father, we want to praise you for what you've done. For that one soul, for those maybe 40 or 50 hands that went up asking for prayer. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the move of the Holy Spirit, what's done here today. In Christ's name we pray, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap offering. Amen.